Facebook and others that might watch us later today on the YouTube, but we're uh, glad to have you with us. Uh, I hope that you've had a chance to grab a handout, familiar with the things that are happening and uh, going on there. Reminder of the ladies of your uh, upcoming retreat. Uh, it's been advertised uh, for some time now, and so certainly want you to participate in that. I think that's at the end of, of this month, and so uh, be aware of that. Also, we want to uh, be aware that school is about to start back, and I know that we have uh, some teachers here and those that work in schools and certainly got some students that uh, are going to be going back, and uh, uh, we, we want to uh, uh, have a quick prayer and ask God to, uh, to bless you and bless your school year and be with you, keep you safe, and hope that, that you have a, uh, a great year. So as we're getting ready to go into our worship, uh, I'll do that, and then we'll uh, continue praising God as Kurt leads us. Let's bow together. Father God, we just thank you for loving us and caring for us the way you do, the awesome God that you are. Father, as uh, we're embarking upon a new school year, uh, Father, uh, there's a lot of anxiety with all of the things that are going on around us. Uh, Father, we just ask you to bless all of our children that will be going back to school, wherever that may be. And, Father, that you will help them have a great year of learning uh, as they make new friends. And, uh, Father, just watch over them and protect them and keep them safe. Be with those teachers and administrators and coaches and all those that will be impacting the lives of these young people. Help them to realize the 
the awesome influence that they carry. And uh, Father, I pray that you will protect them as well and that you will keep them safe. And Father, just uh, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity that they have to be able to to learn and 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 to, to again make friends and 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 just enjoy themselves. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for this time that we now have to praise you and to lift you up and put our focus uh, completely on you. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. And Amen. Let's be standing as Kurt leads us.
chapter 22, verse 37. Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your name alone is holy. You are the great I am, the Lord of all creation, creator of heaven and earth. We humbly come into your presence with boldness made not by our own strength or own will, but because of your mercy and your sacrifice of the great lamb. Hosanna to the great lamb of God who made it possible for us to be called back to you, to be, made, to be made holy by that blood. Father, we are so thankful for the promises that you have made to us and to your people that you would be with us, that we do not need to fear, for you are with us. Father, we're so grateful to be a part of your kingdom here on earth. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen us to continue that work of expanding its borders, taking dominion over this land in your name. Father, we pray that you would continue to raise up people of your truth and your word, people who put their full trust in you, people who look to you for guidance and wisdom. Lord, we pray that we would seek your truth and your kingdom first so that we could build strong people, strong families, strong communities, a strong nation in your name. Father, every day we need you. We need your provision in our lives to take care of the things that weigh us down and burden us 
the simple things of life that we've put so much focus on, we know they're under your control and we trust that you will provide the things we need. Lord, we pray that we would be a people of forgiveness. You have forgiven us of so much. You have shown us so great a love. And Lord, we just pray that we would respond to it by showing mercy to others. Lord, we're thankful for the lamb that was slain. We're thankful for the forgiveness that we have because of your love for us. Lord, we've gathered here today in this place and among these people, calling on your name, putting our faith in you, and recognizing the power of the resurrection, the power that you have over death, conquering and ruling, knowing that we now have a glory set for us for all eternity, a faith and a hope in the eternal presence of yours. We pray that you would continue to be with us as we worship you. You alone are holy and worthy. And we offer this prayer in your son's most blessed and holy name. Amen. I'll be reading this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 16. I'd like to encourage you to go ahead and 
maybe find that in your Bible or on your, uh, your phone and read that along with me. Uh, again, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 16. Before we read that, though, I would like to kind of give you a little background of why I chose this particular passage. I've been a little bit more aware recently in the last few weeks of a struggle that I've been having with concentrating and focusing too much on the physical and not enough on the spiritual. You know, we are all here this morning physically. We're in a physical building. We're sitting in a physical pew, and we're about to take of some physical bread and and juice. And we're going to be remembering Jesus. And we're supposed to do that as a, a group in our assembly this morning. But I think there's something beyond that that we are missing when we don't intentionally focus on this. And again, this has been my struggle. Uh, we all exist, and our reality is, is a physical realm. But when we focus too much on the physical of our existence, we tend to neglect and not experience the, the spiritual realm, which is just as real, but even more important. Now, I know we all agree with that, but again, every day, how often are we really thinking and connecting spiritually with God? I want us to read this passage together to help us focus on that this morning. Starting in verse 16 of chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? Now let me pause here and mention that this word participation, the Greek word koinia, which means sharing, communion, fellowship, to participate or partake in. Keep those synonyms in mind. And is not the bread that we break a participation, a communion, a sharing in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we all partake, share, commune of this one loaf. But pay attention to what he's about to say in connection with this communion and sharing together of this bread and, and, and cup. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Do I mean then that a sacrifice offered to an idol is anything? or that an idol is anything. No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger? than he. I think it's significant that Paul warns against participating by eating meat sacrificed to idols in a spiritual realm that is evil. He acknowledges that. But doesn't that imply that as we eat and drink this together, that we are participating not just physically in being here and eating and drinking, but the, that we are participating in communing in a spiritual realm as well. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 20, when two or three of you are gathered together, I'm there with you. We can't see with our physical eyes, but do you believe in your heart 
that there is a spiritual presence among us today. Jesus. His spirit living within each one of us. That's just as real as me standing before you this morning. So I want to encourage you as we eat and drink together, don't focus just on this physical act, but remember that we are communing and participating in something much greater, much bigger, much deeper in the spiritual realm that we're all a part of. Let's pray and ask God's blessings. Father God, we are so thankful that you give us this morning this reminder, this bread which is the body of Christ that helps us in a physical way to, to eat and to partake and to share, something that reminds us and connects us to the body that was offered on, on that cross and that we are part of that body today in a spiritual sense. And Father, we just pray that you will open our mind's eye this morning to the spiritual reality that is around us in our presence today. That as we make this connection of eating the body, the bread, the body of Christ, that we will understand the spiritual significance and importance of that. Help us as we do that this morning. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Father, we continue in this communion, the sharing together of, of this uh, cup, which helps us to remember the blood that Jesus willingly and lovingly offered and gave on our behalf, his life for ours. And as we drink this, Father, help us to understand deeply and more fully the love that you have for us and the blood that only through that blood has the power and ability to forgive our sins. Help us to realize the cost. Help us to realize that we can only approach you through the blood that Jesus shed for us. Help us as we drink this together. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Part of our participation and sharing together <clears throat> is uh, in our giving as well. Uh, it allows us to materially support and uh, help the works that this congregation is involved in. And again, you can see the ways that uh, we can all participate and share in doing that. So let's remember that that's uh, a very important part of our community together and helping uh, these projects, works, and uh, everything that our, our church family does to be able to do that. Let's give God thanks for all that he does. Father, we do thank you this morning for all the ways that you continually and abundantly shower your blessings on us. Help us to realize, Father, that what we have, what we earn, uh, is all yours to begin with, and that you entrust us with those blessings to, uh, to share and to further the kingdom 
the good news of Jesus in this local area and around the world. We just thank you for all you do for us and help us to always remember uh, who you are and how much you bless us. It's through Christ we pray. Amen. So now it's time for our kids' offering. And talking to Rick this, this week, um, the theme is purpose. And so the first song that came into my mind was this little and just trying to figure out where can I plug this in. I mean, every time I thought about it, I thought about the kids walking down the aisle and, and giving you um, the, 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 the fit really well. So um, we're going to do this, this little light of mine. The kids come and, and bring your offering and, and put it in the bucket. This little light of mine, you know that I know that it shines. This little light of mine, I know that it shines. This little light of mine, you know that I want to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Everywhere I go, you know that I want to let it shine. Everywhere I go, I want to let it shine. Everywhere I go, you know that. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are made up somewhere beyond the blue. Fear is taking me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have a friend like you. If heaven's not my home, stop to consider the number of choices that you make in a day. Almost from the very time that we wake up until we pillow our head again at night, we are making choices. Some of them are easy. Some of them are complex. Some are right. Some are wrong. Some are best and some are better. The truth is our lives are affected and impacted by all of the daily choices that we make. Our lives are essentially the sum of the choices where we've been, our past, where we are right now, our present, where we will be tomorrow, our future. They all have to do with the choices that we make. We're going to begin this morning with a verse that I call a t-shirt verse. It's one of those verses that we, we like to throw around and use a lot. But sometimes we even use it incorrectly. But let me give you the theme of the verse or what's taking place, the context. Joshua has called a meeting of the leaders of Israel. 
and he is reminding them that God has led them out of Egyptian bondage. God has defeated all of their enemies. God has given them this incredible promised land. And yet there's one thing that remains, and that's a choice. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Life really is all about choices. Today we're beginning a series that I'm calling On Purpose. And what I hope that we're able to do over the next several weeks is look at different things that we need to be doing on purpose. And really what our life might look like in these different areas if we choose purpose. There's a man who went to the doctor one day in excruciating pain. The doctor says, well, where does it hurt? He says, it hurts all over. The doctor said, well, touch your shoulder. And when he did, the man cried out in pain. He said, touch your forehead. And when he did, he, he again just cried out in pain. He finally said, well, touch your knee. And he touched his knee and he just, it was an excruciating pain. The doctor did a thorough exam, and he said, I've reached the conclusion that the reason that it hurts to touch is because you have a dislocated finger. <laughs> now, we might laugh at how ridiculous that man's situation may appear. But in a sense, I think we do the same thing in a different way. We complain about life. We say our life has no meaning. We say our life is not going anywhere. And yet the reality of it is, is this, there's one thing that's missing. We're living our life without any sort of purpose. We're simply going through the motions, existing, and living a meaningless life. Now, this is important. Purpose is not measured by what you have done compared to what someone else has done. Purpose is measured by what you have done opposed to what you supposed to have done. And the only way that we can find real purpose in our life is to experience and walk closely with the one who designed us and provides for us our real purpose. One of the great benefits of a close relationship with God is that he will guide you, he will direct you, and he will give you a purpose that he has for you. We just need to truly embrace the words of the psalmist. Be still and know that I am God. And you will begin to experience meaning in your life. I think there are countless examples in the Bible of individuals who live their life with a purpose. For instance, there's Moses. In Hebrews 11, we read, by faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the, the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater than wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking for a reward. And then there was David in Acts chapter 13, it says, For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers. And what about Paul? But I do not account my life any value nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish my course in the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of of God, and on and on and on we could go with individuals that we can read about that when you read their life story, you find purpose. Now let's do a quick time out because so oftentimes when we begin to talk about purpose, 
and we get a little panic inside of us, right? Because what we think about when we think about that is this, trying to define this one huge massive cause for my life, and that can be overwhelming. What am I supposed to do? A a am I supposed to be a missionary? Am I supposed to find the cure for cancer? Am I supposed to help feed all the starving children? What is the one huge impact thing that I must do in my life? And we become frustrated trying to find that purpose. That's not what I want to talk about. What I'd rather talk about is those in-the-moment purposes that God provides for us. That moment when you're called to love or in that moment when you're called to serve or in that moment when you're called to give because I believe there, there, there's power in recognizing that in this moment with this opportunity given to me by my God, I will make a difference. So in this series, I hope that we're able to look at the power in purpose. And that's what we want to begin with today. And as we examine that, first of all, we recognize that purpose eliminates distractions. Unfortunately, our lives are filled with distractions. And perhaps the biggest distraction that any of us have in our life is our busyness. Now the issue is not about good or bad. Because I dare say that the overwhelming majority of the projects and the activities that you find your life caught up in, in and of themselves are good. Nothing wrong with them. But for just a moment, take a mental thought or picture of your weekly schedule. All the stuff that consumes your life. Whatever that might be, maybe it's, maybe it's work, maybe it's school uh, as it's getting back, maybe it's a ball game, maybe it's uh, shopping, maybe it's going camping, maybe it's watching TV, whatever it might be. And here's the deal. Our lives get so crowded that we become efficient but not effective. Efficiency is about doing things right. Effectiveness is about doing the right things. And what God is really concerned about is that we are not just efficient, but that we are effective. Purpose allows me to say yes to the things I need to say yes to and no to the things that I need to say no to. Because otherwise, here's what happens. And I know it happens because it happens in my life all the time. All of this stuff becomes a distraction to the call of God on my life. The Bible gives us a great example of what we're talking about in this point. It's the story of Nehemiah. Now, if you're not familiar with that story, here's the deal. Nehemiah was a cupbearer for the king, and he's brokenhearted over the condition of his hometown. Jerusalem, the walls have been torn down, the, city, the uh, uh, gates have been burned, and so he decides somebody needs to do something about this, and why not me? So he goes to the king, gets permission to go back, and him about 50,000 Jews go back and they decide to rebuild the walls of the city. And it's not long in that project that here come the distractions. You're never going to finish this. Even if you built a wall, if a fox went by and bumped into it, the wall would fall down. This is just a dream that's never going to happen. And one day Nehemiah is up on a ladder and he is faced with the distraction of doubt and discouragement. And I love what he said. I sent messengers to them saying, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? 
In other words, I'm fulfilling God's purpose in my life. Why should I be bothered by you? Some of us need to internalize that just a little bit. Nehemiah is doing a great work. Why should I come down? Why should I stop that? Because there's times that that your purpose in the moment might not seem like such a big deal. But you're doing a great work. That might mean raising your kids. It may mean at school. It may mean at work. It may mean wherever. But you're doing a great work. And you have been positioned by God that in that moment, you don't need to come down. You don't need to compromise. You don't need to stop doing what it is that God has called you to do. Don't get distracted. Don't allow the distractions to to, to choke out God's will for your life. You say to Satan, I'm doing a good work, and I'm not coming down. The second thing about purpose and the power of it is that it endures pain. I can almost promise you that you're not going to go far in this journey in finding purpose for your life that you're not going to discover some pain. It happened for Moses. It happened for David. It happened for Paul. It even happened for Jesus. Purpose does not come without opposition. Obstacles will get in the way. Storms will come. Pain will happen. You remember after the resurrection, Jesus calls his disciples together up on a mountain, and he says to them, I want you to go into all the world, and I want you to teach people, baptize them, and make disciples in all nations. Now, the literal translation of that is, as you are going. As you go through life, here is a purpose. Now, if you step back from that, before the cross, you might remember in John, the 16th chapter, Jesus said this, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, before Jesus ever said, let me give you an incredible purpose, he warned them there's going to be pain. And the problem that we have too often is this. Our focus becomes on the pain, and we lose focus on the purpose. Someone said it like this. When you're knee-deep in alligators, it's difficult to keep in mind the fact that your primary purpose is to drain the swamp. In Philippians chapter 1, look at these words. For I know... That through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed. But with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Now think about the guy who wrote that. He's in a prison cell. He had been shipwrecked three times. Stoned, scourged, been in prison, beaten with rods. And yet his purpose in life was what? To magnify Christ no matter what. Either in my life or either in my death. You see, this is a tough pill to swallow. Because it is natural and logic for us to think, if I'm doing the purpose of God in my life, then nothing bad should ever beset me. I think we can all agree Paul was doing the purpose of God in his life. And yet all of these things happened to him. And the same thing is true in your life. You may be in the moment doing all the purposes for God, but yet there's still pain. There's still stuff that happens. Never forget, the path to the cross was not easy. Every step of the way was difficult for Jesus. The pain that Jesus experienced was not just the nails in his hands. 
It was all the stuff that happened to him on the way getting to those nails. And yet he endured the shame and he went to the cross. And we have to push through the pain and we have to remember something. This is my cross. This is the one I was meant to carry. You remember what Jesus said? He said, if you want to come after me, take up your cross and follow me. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. And finally, the power and purpose is this, that purpose empowers life. This is what happened to these people we cited this morning. This is what they, they tapped into. Why was it that Moses kept going back and talking to Pharaoh? Why did Paul keep preaching after all that stuff happened to him? Why was it that Nehemiah kept building the wall? There's one reason. They all knew this. I am pleasing God. Remember in Acts chapter 4, it's Peter and John, they're brought before the council, and the council tells them, you need to stop. You need to stop talking about Jesus what did they do? How did they react to that? But Peter and John answered them saying, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you or rather uh, to God, you must judge for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. You can beat us. You can imprison us. You can kill us. But we're going to do what pleases God. Now, the million-dollar question is this. What pleases God? How do you please God? And we could probably come up with about a million answers, right? But the Hebrew writer said this, but without faith it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Hear me, church. Pleasing God is not some one-time, huge, massive experience. Pleasing God is in the moment, daily, drawing near to Him. Don't go looking for the will of God. Go looking for God, and when you find Him, you will find His will. It's in that close, intimate relationship with the Father that we not only discover, but we will also live out the destiny that God has planned and prepared for each of our lives. And our problem is this. We're more concerned about pleasing people than we are about pleasing God. More concerned about how many likes I got on Facebook this week or how many followers I got or, or how many shares I got. Remember the verse we read earlier about Moses? The Bible said he regarded the sake of Christ more valuable than the treasures of Egypt. There's value in popularity. There is value in pleasure. There is value in position. But there is a greater value in the calling of God on each of our lives. And the cool part of all of this is this. God has designed us in such a way and equipped us in such a way <laughs> that we are able to fulfill the purposes that God gives us in our life. In Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Purpose. It empowers our lives in the moment. It allows us to do what we were designed to do. As we close this morning, some of you might recognize the name Lau Alzado. He was a Hall of Fame player in the NFL, played for the Broncos, Browns, and Raiders, mostly for the Raiders. Alzado was 300 pounds of pure muscle. But the way he got there was anabolic steroids. He said that at the height of his career, it was costing him $30,000 a year for the steroid use. 
at one point in time in an interview, he talked about how that he had a doctor pull steroids out of a horse and inject them into his body so that he could play football and try to play it better than anybody else. Alzado died at 43 years old from a brain tumor from the abuse of steroids. In a Sports Illustrated interview, he made this statement. It was not worth it. It was not worth it. One day, you and I will look back on our lives and we will reflect upon all the choices we made. The big, in the moment, huge, impactful choices. And we will have to decide. Doing this and not that, or going here and not there. Choosing this or choosing that. Was it worth it? Was it worth it? I can tell you with all honesty, if you choose Jesus Christ, it's worth it. No matter what it costs you, no matter what you have to give up, no matter what, choosing God is worth it. So today, why you decide about God and about Jesus, let's stand and sing.
testimony that when we take our, our love and that, that God has given us outside in the community, the impact that it can have on people. You know, Devin has been, this summer has probably been one of our most faithful youth group members. We've got to spend a lot of time this together on trips and, and class. He's always there. And it all started, you know, with, with some people showing some love and, and taking it out into the community and the power that God has when we allow him to work through us. So I'm so excited that Devin has come forward wishing to be baptized this morning. So, Devin, I'm going to ask you this question. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? I know you do, and it's awesome. And so these guys are going to take you back and help you, and then I will meet you up here. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. God by Based on your confession, it's my privilege and honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit for the remission of your sins.
celebration of um, somebody who was just born again and, and become part of the family and um, shows the world that that we're still here and that we're going to be loud and we're going to be um, a, 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 the light in the world that you call us to be and help us to always remember that and to take it with us everywhere we go that the world knows that we're different and we're different because you live in us and um, I know as a teacher, going back to school um, is, is kind of the start of a new year and just help us to stay focused on, on who you are and, and let your light shine in us every day. And um, teachers and students and any decision makers that are going into um, going into what what's going to happen with the school year, we don't really know what it's going to look like. And um, But the biggest thing, God, we just ask that you take this virus away. Um, pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 